Okay, so in the last um, talk, we looked at understanding the system a bit more. We talked, we focused on freedom, uh, how to attain freedom from problems and their sources. In this talk, I want to talk more about the path. What is this path that helps us to accomplish freedom? So the goal, of course, of the path is to find freedom, um, freedom from our problems and and the way that those problems accumulate, the origin of those, of those problems. So you notice that just as this path leads to freedom, there's a little bit of a parallel to these accumulations or origins leading to inner problems. And that's why I mentioned that these two are a bit more like causes. These two are a bit more like effects. Um, so what is the path that leads to freedom? So I mentioned when we talk about these accumulations, the root of the problem is ignorance. Um, and one of the most um, obvious and important kinds of ignorance is what we call permanent grasping. And permanent grasping arises because we have this incredibly, um, our, our brains are conserving a lot of energy by coming to a very, very hyper simplified understanding of the world and just thinking, you know, this is a certain way and it'll always be a certain way and our minds just ignore, literally, which is why we call it ignorance, the ever-changing nature of things, the, the subjective nature of things, the, the fact that everything is made of countless other parts, that all things exist as part of other systems. We ignore all of that and we just think, ah, I exist and I want this or I want that or I don't want that and this gives rise to craving. And if we can't get what we want, that gives rise to hatred. And so all of these are at the root. So the path to overcoming these problems, um, the path in particular is a path of overcoming ignorance. And the main part of the path is, um, how shall I represent this? The main part of the path is wisdom. And wisdom is specifically an antidote to ignorance. That's the idea that um, that ignorance, that wisdom opposes ignorance uh, or in fact uh, overcomes ignorance. Let me move all of these down a bit. Okay, so what is this path? Um, the primary path is wisdom. And that wisdom is intentionally for the purpose of overcoming ignorance, wisdom being the opposite of ignorance. So whereas ignorance might include a permanent grasping, wisdom includes, for example, the, um, the experience of uh, impermanence. Um, So this experience of impermanence is, uh, notice I say the experience of impermanence as opposed to just the conceptual knowledge of impermanence. Um, and so wisdom really can exist on two levels. It can be either a uh, um, conceptual, uh, theoretical understanding Uh, or it can be a, uh, a direct and practical understanding. So, as the saying goes, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. There's nothing more practical than a good theory. So actually, this conceptual understanding is the way to get at this practical understanding. Now, the the thing, when, when I say conceptual, I mean something that is done through, that can be framed in terms of words, uh, words and concepts. A anything that I say, um, I, these words that I'm saying, they're coming because I'm generating concepts in my mind. Um, there is the idea of, in, in what's called the theory of knowledge or uh, epistemology, um, there's the idea of tacit knowledge, uh, and 
and then explicit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is something you know, but you can't necessarily explain how you know it. I know how to I know how to chew, for example. But can I explain exactly how I chew? You know, some movement of the tongue, some movement of the jaw, or walk. How do I walk? But how do I keep my balance? There's a I can give a little bit of description, but I can't give description in any kind of great detail. Now, maybe there are experts on um, chewing or there's experts on balance and walking and so forth that could describe in detail all of the muscle groups that are being involved and the vestibular system that keeps your balance and all these kinds of things. My ability to give that kind of explanation is very limited. Um, but nevertheless, I have utter confidence in my ability to chew and walk and all kinds of other things we need to do to get through our daily life. And that's what's called tacit knowledge. It's stuff you know, but you can't necessarily explain or you'd have to work hard to explain something. Um, so um, the tacit knowledge is um, the direct knowledge, the practical understanding. But we can build tacit knowledge by intellectually understanding something and then getting so familiar with it that it just becomes ingrained. And that's that's what we call um, uh, training, basically. So training, when you're talking about training, it's more than just understanding something intellectually. It's getting so familiar with doing something that it becomes tacit knowledge. Um, and this tacit knowledge um, is fast it just becomes sort of implicit it's a it's a fast part of our mind and it can actually be used to solve our problems and so the way to know that your understanding of these things is correct um, is that it actually has the power to directly overcome your problems and let me uh, reorder these a bit because um, i want to emphasize that to actually solve these problems of, of ignorance, it is not the conceptual understanding that has the real power to overcome ignorance. It is the non-conceptual, direct experience, uh, the direct practical knowledge that has the power to overcome ignorance. Um, so this um, ignorance is uh, often called the the enemy, right? This is a real, this is called the root poison of all of these different uh, other, all of, sometimes these are called delusions or defilements in the mind. They're basically polluting the mind. But the main point is to overcome, um, to overcome ignorance using wisdom, but in particular, it's this direct practical understanding that we need to use to accomplish this wisdom. Um, So, okay, so we need to train. Uh, now, what, what I, uh, I was starting to say, what I can explain with words is coming from my conceptual understanding. So I have some practical understanding, some direct knowledge, but that um, I have also learned, you know, some words and concepts to describe the way the mind operates. And, I, and, and I've learned that through my own teachers, right? And so uh, this is where our teachers become extremely important because they can help us to build a conceptual or theoretical understanding. And that is a fantastic foundation. So because of the kindness of my own teachers, then I've had an opportunity to develop some clear way of describing and understanding these, these things. Uh, that I'm then now trying to pass along to whoever watches this video. Hi. Um, but that's not enough. And just intellectually understanding or conceptually understanding is not enough. It needs to actually be put into practice in our daily life. Um, and it needs to be deeply investigated and experienced and so forth. And that's where a teacher can only take you so far. So sometimes uh, we talk about there's a distinction between... Um, two teachers, uh, the the um, outer uh, teacher, and that's, a say, a person, for example. The outer teacher is the one who can actually uh, explain to you the um, with words what's going on. But then the 
inner teacher is our own mind, right? Uh, and the inner teacher is wisdom itself. And so from the outer teacher, you develop the inner teacher. And the inner teacher is this direct practical understanding. Um, and so it is also training, we can say, that builds this inner teacher, um, training uh, this conceptual understanding uh, leads to the direct understanding through building this this inner teacher. So you can say the outer teacher helps you to build your inner teacher, uh, and the inner teacher helps you to overcome overcome ignorance. Uh, so hopefully that uh, that makes sense. Maybe I'll describe it in this way. So. Um, this is good news that it is possible to get some help. Now, um, the outer teacher can only take you to this certain place. And so this part here is up to you and your work and your experience. Now, what does it take to engage in training? Um, what does it take to actually move this conceptual theoretical understanding to a direct and practical understanding? Well, um, you need uh, you need two things. You need the the mind to be um, uh, peaceful, focused. Um, what should we say? Um, a stable mind, basically, that allows you to see directly. Um, a stable mind allows you to see directly some of these these realities. So to, and the stable mind is part of a part of gaining this um, direct understanding. Um, uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of um, dots appearing here, but how shall I represent this? So the stable mind is part of this training. And so when we talk about training, um, we're really talking about building a stable mind um, that, is, that is helping us to gain this direct practical understanding. Now, what does this mean? What do I mean by a stable or still mind? So what I mean is that when we're talking about ignorance, overcoming ignorance and overcoming craving and hatred and so forth, we have to be able to see these operating inside our own mind um, because these are minds they are invisible right you can't actually see these with the eye you can only see them when you look inside your own mind and so the process of getting to know your own mind getting to know identifying your ignorance your craving your hatred these tendencies to um, exaggerate physical pains and problems uh, develop suffering and so forth. It's something we have to observe in our own mind, and you can only notice that if your mind is stable and still and concentrated. And so there's a lot of words we might use for this um, stable, still, concentrated, um, focused mind, something like that. Now, how do we develop that stable, still, concentrated, focused mind? This is where the practice of meditation comes in. And so meditation is an activity, a training, that is a training in stabilizing the mind. That's literally what, whoops, that's literally what meditation is. Um, meditation is sometimes called mental stabilization, mental stabilization. And our, through the practice of mental stabilization, you develop this stable, still, calm, concentrated mind. And that is, in fact, the goal of meditation, to build this stable, still, concentrated mind. So from uh, to build, to develop wisdom, uh, we rely upon some understanding. Maybe we receive it from teachers, um, but 
gradually we need to rely upon the meditation to develop a stable mind so we can actually develop that direct perception, that direct mental experience of, of these wisdom truths. Now, one of the main challenges that people face when they try to learn meditation is that it does take uh, some discipline. Um, it takes discipline because the first overwhelming experience that people have when they are trying to meditate is they, you know, the teacher says, oh, okay, focus on your breath. And okay, see so you're breathing. Of course, you can focus on your breath for a few breaths. But very quickly, your mind goes off to something else and your distractions uh, undermine uh, this, um, your meditation. And so distractions we could think of as a, as an enemy or as an opponent to these, uh, our ability to, to focus. And so we can say that distraction is undermining uh, or trying to prevent this, um, undermining or trying to prevent this stable, still, concentrated mind. We can say it's subtracting from that. It's 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 damaging that. Um, and so, in the beginning, when people first try to to meditate, the biggest obstacle is all of this distraction. And so, they have to use a significant amount of discipline to try to overcome these distractions. Um, and the purpose of this discipline is literally to overcome the distractions to try to to reduce and overcome these distractions. And by reducing and overcoming the distractions, you reduce and overcome the things that disturb the mind, and so your mind can become more and more and more still. So discipline is a basic foundation for meditation. Meditation, in turn, is a basic foundation for wisdom. And wisdom itself is what we need to overcome this ignorance of uh, permanent grasping, say. Maybe we can represent it like that, this sort of negative relationship. So as you can see, some of these relationships are positive. These are supportive relationships. Concentration supports the development of wisdom, but wisdom is there to overcome ignorance. Uh, Distraction overcomes concentration, but discipline is there to overcome the challenges of distraction. Now, discipline, meditation is something that we primarily just experience during formal, very focused, very quiet meditation sessions. The characteristic of meditation is generally it should be quiet, focused time. Discipline, though, is something that we can be carrying out in our daily lives. And so discipline is um, um, we can say that this discipline has two parts, two types. There's discipline in daily life, and then there's discipline in, uh, in meditation. But these two they they feed off of each other. So discipline and meditation is what's actually opposing uh, our distractions. So the discipline that we do in meditation is what directly opposes these distractions. But the discipline that we practice in daily life is what enables us to have this discipline in meditation. So discipline in daily life means things like making a strong, rock-solid decision not to uh, lie, not to kill, not to steal, not to cheat, not to uh, engage in uh, sexual misconduct, these kinds of things. This discipline in daily life, because the vast majority of our life is spent not in formal meditation sessions, this one is critically important. And discipline in daily life is one of the most important things that we can possibly do to strengthen this whole process because discipline in daily life builds mental strength. Um,
do you have a strong mind or do you have a weak mind? Uh, it is dis it is the mental strength that actually really most helps us to develop this discipline in meditation, that ability to decide, I'm going to focus on this and I'm not going to focus on anything else. How well are you able to carry that out? From one point of view, you know, to meditate for one minute on the breathing, how simple an instruction could you possibly have? Like, how much simpler could it get? Well, what is your ability to decide that you're going to do something, even if it lasts just one minute, and actually carry that out? That comes down to your mental strength, the strength of your will, the strength of your intention. And so, as we can see, although uh, this diagram has become quite complicated, there are essentially three of these key practices, uh, three of these that are called the three higher trainings discipline. Uh, in particular, we're talking about an ethical discipline, discipline in a virtuous context, uh, discipline with the intention to be a good person, not be a bad person. You can have very disciplined people who are evil as well, like, um, you know, uh, very disciplined gangster, very disciplined serial killer, or something like that. That is not the discipline we're talking about here. We're talking about an ethical discipline that leads to discipline in daily life, builds the mental strength to support us in our meditation, to overcome distractions. We can develop a, a stable, still, concentrated, focused mind. And through that stable, still, concentrated, focused mind, we can actually develop this direct, practical understanding um, that is essentially the inner teacher that allows us to take this conceptual theoretical understanding that we might have received from outer teachers um, and use it to directly oppose our own ignorance. So um, uh, quite a big diagram here. I'll move this, create a little bit more space here. But hopefully you get some sense for the relationship between these things. The path effectively is this. It is on the foundation or on the ground of moral discipline. Um, we, um, we can then build this mental stabilization, this stability. And um, from that, we can accomplish wisdom, the wisdom that can actually solve our problems. If you think about these problems, craving and attachment, we understand how hatred uh, can cause enormous suffering. You know, out of hatred, you killed your spouse, something like that, and you spent the rest of your life in prison. Was this wise? No, it was not wise. Um, out of hatred, you were, you know, ab abusive to your boss. And as a result, you lost your job or you lost respect or whatever. Was that wise? Probably not. Um, but sometimes the reason this hatred feels so unavoidable is because the craving has, has become so intense, right? We just didn't feel like we had any option. And the craving becomes so intense because of ignorance, because of just not understanding ourself, the world, the relationship between them effectively enough. And so wisdom is really what we need to overcome ignorance uh, and then to become free from all craving and hatred and all of the other kinds of sufferings and pains and problems that they give rise to. Um, so this hopefully gives you some understanding of the path and as a result of following the path, you'll accomplish these freedoms. So.